Hey, welcome to another episode of Boat Anchors. We've got another old HP here, and this one is a 3325A synthesizer function generator. Useful bit of kit. Uh, this one can actually produce uh, sine waves, square waves, triangle waves, ramp up, and also ramp down sawtooth waves. Um, I bought it on Yahoo Auctions for a reasonable price, and um, I was expecting it to need a little bit of work. It does need a little bit of work, but it does function. It outputs a signal, and it seems to be pretty stable. Um, it does need a few little bits and pieces, like I want to replace some capacitors as you know, as is course for a uh, piece of equipment this age, from the early 80s. Um, the fan's dead, I need to put a new fan in, and a few little bits and pieces like that. Also, it's got two optional um optional options, two optional extras you can add into this. One is a um, high stability uh, 10 megahertz reference oscillator and the, that goes inside and then gives it a, a more stable reference so that your uh, output is consequently more stable as well. Uh, this doesn't have that. Uh, I'm not going to make one of those because I need to I need the uh, oscillator. I can't actually build the uh, ovenized oscillator. It's an oven controlled crystal oscillator. So I'll have to buy one of those if I want to do that. But the uh, the other option, option 002, is pretty cool. It allows you to um, output 40 volts peak to peak um, at 40 milliamps between the ranges of 0 to 1 megahertz. There's a button here for that to turn that on. Above 1 megahertz, it won't output that um, 40 volts. But between 0 and 1 megahertz, you get your 40 volts at 40 milliamps. So it's good for circuits that need a, a high drive uh, voltage. And that's just a little circuit board that goes in, and um, there's nothing too special about it. So I'm thinking we might make one of those and stick it in here. Get that option uh, installed so we got a bit more functionality out of this unit. So first things first, let's turn it on, and we'll see how it goes. So let's turn this, first of all, up to maybe 10 kilohertz. I only go to 10 kilohertz because the, the sine wave goes to 20 megahertz, the square wave to 10 megahertz, but the uh, triangle and uh, ramp up and ramp down sawtooth only go to at uh, 10 kilohertz. It's just a, the limitation of the unit, I guess. So to show the functions, we'll go to the maximum of the lowest, uh, the lowest limitation, which is 10 kilohertz. So let's set that, and the amplitude we can set it to uh, 8 volts. Uh, no, I'll set it to 0.8 volts. There we go. Uh, down, 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 down. All right. So we got eight volts at 10 kilohertz, and you can see on the scope here, we get a nice trace. So it is working quite well. If we go to a square wave, there's a square wave. Nice sharp edges. I've got a, a 50 ohm termination here, a feed through terminator, because this is uh, rated with its ratings. It's rated when you terminate it into a um, 50 ohms. So. We've got nice Canair cable, which I built myself, with a proper crimp and everything, straight into the uh, the scope through that terminator, so it's a, as perfect of a connection as you can get. So we we'll get a nice square square wave, the uh, triangle wave, there we go, nice and pointy. Then the ramp up, ramp up sawtooth there, it's pretty good, and the ramp down sawtooth. I think that's what it's called, I'm going to call it ramp up and ramp down because it seems reasonable. So all the functions work. Another cool function about this unit, it's got a uh, sweep function, and we can sweep over a linear or a logarithmic, uh, like sweep range or scale. So at the moment I've got it set to a 40 kilohertz at start, 5 kilohertz to finish, and a 2 second sweep time. So if I hit the uh, constant start, you'll see there, it's sweeping up and down. Working quite well. If I go to a square wave, and I'll start that going. Pretty good. We've also got DC offset, so we can move the uh, the waveform up and down. So I can make those only positive pulses by offsetting the DC up, that sort of thing. And uh, phase, we've got uh, sync out, so we can synchronize to the uh, to our test circuit or to the scope or whatever. It's it's all working quite well. So I guess the next step is we'll open it up, have a look inside, and see what we're going to do this thing. Just before I get started on the capacitor replacement, I had a thought I should um, let you guys know something about uh, old HP gear. A lot of older HP gear uses PosiDrive screws. Now they're different from a Phillips screw. A Phillips screwdriver will fit into a PosiDrive um, screw, but it will damage the screw. We got two here. 
This one is a Philips and this one is a Posi drive. Hopefully you can see if I bring it up close. If I turn those, you might be able to see a slight difference. The Philips has a standard Philips shape, which everyone knows and loves. And on the, the left, we've got the Posi drive. You can see the extra little mini flute in between the larger flutes. That gives you extra grip. Also, um, the, the large flute is parallel, whereas on the uh, Philips bit, it's uh, tapered. The reason why the Philips is tapered is back in the day before they had uh, torque limiting mechanisms on their drills and on their screwdrivers and stuff, uh, they made the Philips uh, bit tapered so that at a certain torque, it'll cam out of the, um, the screw so it won't snap the screw off. You risk damaging the head of the screw, but it won't snap the screw. Um, we still use them because it's just legacy, but the Posi drive is an improvement where because they're, um, their flutes are parallel, they won't come out and you can put a lot more torque through and then it relies on the torque limiting of your screwdriver or your, your battery drill or your driver to make sure that it doesn't break the, uh, break the screw off. But um, a lot of HP gear, HP gear uses the Posi drive and if you try and put the uh, Phillips screwdriver in, it will work, but because it's tapered and the, the uh, screw is parallel, it won't fit right and will round off the screw. Um, I've got a uh, Posi drive screw here to demonstrate with. I will show you this one. You can see in that screw, you got the standard plus shape of the uh, Phillips. This is equal to the Phillips, but they're actually parallel all the way down. They don't, um, they don't taper down. Also, you, you can probably see there the little um, extra flutes, little like little stars coming out for the extra grip of the posi drive. So make sure, double check, and um, don't use a Phillips in a posi drive because you'll damage them. Often with the old HP gear, you'll see you know, when you undo the, uh, the screw to take the case out, it'll be all like a bit munched up and whatever. That's because someone's gone and used a Phillips bit. And the Phillips bit, when you, when you use a Phillips driver in the, uh, the screw, it doesn't feel right and it does cam out very easily, damaging that screw. So if it's a posi drive screw, Use a posi drive screwdriver. Go and invest in a, uh, a PZ2, which is equal to a Phillips 2 in size, and a PZ1, which is a smaller size, equal in size to a, a Phillips size 1. And that will get you through most um, HP gear. So I'm just uh, getting onto these capacitors in this power board, and I thought I'd show you something that never ceases to blow my mind. That's the old uh, bulk power supply filtering cap, 8000 microfarad at 16 volts. And you can see there, it's a real, it's a real chonker. <laughs> it's huge. The modern equivalent, 16 volt, 8,200 microfarad. They don't make 8,000 microfarad as a standard value anymore. It's been standardized to 8,200, so that's fine. But look at it, it's shorter by a whole, what's that, a whole centimeter. And it's like half the diameter. That is ridiculous. That will do the same job as that. That would actually probably do it better because this one is a um, 105 degree rated and it's got a high ripple rating and a low ESR. Well, kind of low ESR. It's not ridiculously low. But yeah, that's, that's technology. It just, I always blow my mind. I always double check because you can see here, this one is the same size as these. And these are uh, 1,000 microfarad at 35 volts. This is 8,200 and it's about the same size. So there's eight times the capacity of this. And it's the same size. It's, it blows my mind. So I can even go up one size. This is a 35 volt, 10,000 microfarad. So it's 2,000 microfarad more. Same length, three quarters of diameter. So even that is still, still smaller, even though I've gone up in voltage and up in capacitance. So I might use that one because this, is a, this capacitor is actually just uh, bulk power supply filtering. It's across these uh, diodes and it's just smoothing that uh, AC or the, the rectified DC. Uh, into smooth DC. So a little bit more capacitance is always a nice thing. I also notice there's these two holes here. These two holes just at the tips of my fingers. I'll hold that up. These two holes here are for the leads. So they bend over and go in there like that. But these extra two holes, they're a standard, uh, a standard width to use stud mount or screw mount. See those uh, terminals are actually screws or screw holes. So that can sit there like that and uh, it'll screw in from the bottom. So I just noticed that when I took the, uh, the old one out. So I could probably just put a screw mount one in there if I wanted. I might look into that because um, I like that idea. 
because uh, this one was so big it had to be cable tied down. I've just snipped the cable tie. And uh, these two holes here, this one and this one, that's for the cable tie. But if I put a screw mount one down, um, it might be a bit neater. I'll have a look into what I can get to put there. One other quick note, uh, if you get stuck and uh, you pull the capacitor out and it's not marked, this one actually has a, uh, a little plus there. But if it's not marked um, on a lot of these, uh, these circuit boards, they're not. The plus is always the square pad. If you see there, that pad there is square. That's the plus. I'm hoping that comes up all right on the screen. And that's a circle, so that's the minus. On the uh, HP, it's always that way around. I, I can't vouch for other um, manufacturers, but in all the HP gear I've seen, square is always plus. All right, so here we are with the front panel. Um, I've already taken it all apart, as you can see. I'm going to give this a nice clean over, get rid of all the uh, the goop and the the finger slime that's all over it. Um, this is the board that sits inside. I've replaced the capacitor there as a good measure, just as, you know, I've got it open, so I may as well replace it. I'm going to take all of these caps off. I'm going to take a photo first. Always remember to take a photo. Although it's going to be a pain in the bum to get them all back in the right positions. I'll give them a good clean up. You can see here, a bit of dirt there. I'll clean all that off so they're all nice and uh, clean and shiny again. And also these switches are a little bit, oh, hold up to the mic, they're a little bit clicky. Um, these are called Bill West switches uh, after the man who invented them, Bill West. And uh, HP used to use these switches uh, because they were cheaper at the time than using micro switches. Nowadays, micro switches are so cheap that you may as well use those. But at the time that this was made, uh, these were actually cheaper than... Uh, than the micro switches that came off the shelf. So uh, that you'll find these in this sort of uh, HP, this age, HP test equipment, heaps of them all over the place. Uh, but they are expensive these days because um, HP never released these as a part that you could actually buy. Um, if one of them broke, you had to send it back to them. And uh, they would then heat stake these down. You see all these red dots. Uh, when you put these switch in, you had little pins sticking out and they had like a, a machine that they would basically melt the plastic down and uh, HP claimed they had the special machine that put the, the correct amount of force at the correct temperature and all that. But in reality, you can use a soldering iron with a, um, a modified tip to go and stake them down yourself. But HP um, uh, claimed that you couldn't do that and you had to send the board back to them. So you could actually get these switches very easily at all, um, not already installed. So nowadays they cost quite a bit, about 50 bucks each. I've seen them on eBay just for the, uh, the single switch. So I'm not going to um, go and replace any of these. I'm going to uh, fix them up. I'm going to do a bit of uh, work on them. So one of the things you can do to stop that clickiness, well, there's two things you can do. One is you flip over the, uh, the little spring still in there. And the other thing is you can put a bit of lubrication on, the, um, on the, the bit that moves up and down inside there. So I'll go ahead and remove all these, uh, these uh, switch caps, these button caps. And uh, then I'll show you the process to make these nice and smooth again. Keycaps are off. We already start playing with the guts of these switches. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull each leaf spring out. Each switch has a little leaf spring in there. And when you press down with a certain amount of force, it'll buckle and click down. And that's where you get that kind of clicky feeling. But what happens is they, they tend to bend into a shape and uh, it makes it a bit too much force. And they get that real like harsh click to them. So we're going to flip those uh, each one of these little leaf springs around. And also I'm going to use some lithium grease some plastic safe lithium grease that's also non-conductive and just put it on each side of the uh, the white section where it slides into the red. Just give it a little bit of lubrication. You don't need much, just a tiny little bit just to help it out a bit. I've got this uh, syringe here with a, a non-sharp very fine tip and that's going to let me get right in there as I need. So let's zoom in and have a look at how to do this switch. So what you need is some fine tweezers. You can flick that uh, spring out if I hold that there in the right angle, you'll be able to see. Oh, hang on. There's a slight bend up at this side. So we want to. That, that's formed because normally the sw the uh, spring curves up on the left, up to the uh, the white section. So if we flick that around, stick it back in. So 
a little bit fiddly. We'll see how I'll go on camera. Just like that. You can see that is buckling up here. And because that curve is now up on this side, it just helps it out and it makes the uh, switch feel real soft and not squishy, gross gro soft, but nice, a nice uh, button feel there. Whereas the old ones are a little bit too clicky. And then a little bit of grease, just a little tiny bit. Tiniest, tiniest little bit. And we've got a nice button. I'll just wipe off a bit of excess grease because you only need a mi almost microscopic amount. And that one is done. Nice. So I'm going to go ahead and do all the rest of these switches. And then we should have a good control panel. So on to the high voltage option. So here we got the uh, schematic. It's all pretty much the same as the HP manual. Just replicated the, the schematic from there and um, draw it up in dip trace here. So we've got the input uh, jack over here. Uh, that comes in through our uh, match transistor set here. Uh, got some diodes here for uh, protection and uh, some level clipping and whatnot. Comes around, it's basically a, a push-pull amplifier, nothing too special. We've got an output transistor over here. And then out through a fuse, so if you do something stupid, you won't blow the uh, transistors, you blow the fuse instead. And then out through the output jack over on the right-hand side here. Uh, these jacks aren't on the outside of the case, they're internal, because the, uh, the unit uses RCA jacks to connect all the circuit boards together inside. So these are just uh, RCA jacks on the circuit board itself. And then down the bottom here, we've got the um, linear dual rail power supply. Nothing too crazy. We've got our full bridge rectifier sitting down here. Linear regulators and um, some capacitors for smoothing as is normal for a uh, linear, re uh, linear power supply. Uh, over here, we've got CR1 and CR2. They're just uh, Zener diodes to set the output voltage, plus 30 and minus 30 volts. So yeah, that's pretty much all we got there, standard push-pull amplifier, nothing too special. Just goes up to a megahertz rather than, uh, what, 20 kilohertz like an audio amp. You probably could use this for an audio amp, actually, maybe. So uh, if we head over to here, we've got our circuit board layout. Uh, all replicated as per the uh, HP design. I was working off some photos to start with, but then I managed to get my hands on an original, uh, original option board. So I was able to use that to get this thing pretty much spot on, apart from a few little changes that were needed, like... Uh, Capacitor 15 here, capacitor 14 here, they were tantalums, uh, axial tantalums in the original and uh, they're rather expensive uh, and um, yeah, they're not as readily available as uh, electrolytics, so I've put electrolytics in there and that works fine, it's not a problem at all. Also uh, Q1A and Q1B, which is that match transistor set, in the original it's one package with two transistor dies inside which are perfectly matched. That package costs about $10 a pop and... Um, yeah, it's it's not as easy to get as the TO92 packages that I used. Uh, these things are available almost everywhere. So what I've done is I've uh, used two packages there, put face to face. I'll glue them together so that they're thermally coupled, and um, they've been matched. They'll be matched on a um, a transistor tester, so they're pretty much the same. And being thermally coupled, they won't drift apart when they warm up and whatnot. Also, as you can see across the top, no solder mask or silk screen on the top layer. Uh, that's also to match the original HP design because uh, I guess in the 80s, silk screen and solder mask cost a bit more than what they wanted to pay for, so they didn't do it on the top. So all this red or this maroon colour, the traces and the uh, the copper fill, that's all going to be bare, but it'll be um, it'll be gold plated as per the original as well. So the bottom, that'll be uh, solder mask as per normal, the green solder mask. All that blue will be covered, and you see the uh, the black pads which will be gold plated uh, poking through. So um, let's have a look at it in 3D. Hit the 3D button and uh, wait. 
So there we are. Looking pretty good. So we got the um, that match set over here. They'll be uh, glued together. Our uh, electrolytic capacitors here and here. Um, we've got oh yeah, we got some uh, little ferrite beads on the transistors here. They uh, they were there on the original, so I thought hey, if the uh, HP engines put it on there, I'll put it on there too. It's not actually st stated on the uh, schematic, but I think they're in the um, the bill of materials. But they'll be there to help prevent any high frequency oscillations. Just add a bit of damping to the the leads there. You got the uh, RCA lead, uh, RCA plugs on the top, the RCA jacks, plugs, whatever. Uh, two of them there. This big heatsink here, that's uh, got our two transistors for the uh, the output power transistors. And we got our two uh, voltage regulators there and um, the full bridge rectifier, everybody's favourite up the top left corner. And uh, all those little red dots, they're just the test points for um, testing your voltages and uh, whatnot for calibration and uh, performance testing. And here we are with the two boards. Top one is the HP version, bottom one is mine. Pretty much spot on. A few differences as I've uh, talked about before. We've got these uh, tubular capacitors, the white ones here, which I've replaced with the MLCC style three hole types. The uh, two transistors here, which are face to face, super glued together and uh, roughly matched. And then this is the uh, $10 part here. And uh, just a few basic other things like uh, the capacitors are not tantalums. We've got two tantalums there. These ones are just uh, electrolytics. And that's about it. Everything else is pretty much exactly the same. So I got this one uh, after I started building this one um, and then used that as the reference. But this one is actually still a little bit faulty apparently. Um, there's something not quite right with this one. So I'm going to throw this one into my unit and um, see how it goes. Alright, so we're looking at the top of the unit. Um, I'll show you the uh, option 2 installed in a moment. It's on the underside there, this uh, central panel. It's got boards on both sides. So first we're looking at the top. We've got the power supply here. All uh, new capacitors. This one here I've uh, put a 10,000 microfarad uh, 35 volt. Uh, I couldn't find one that would fit that has the uh, the push pins or the uh, the screw mount. They're all too tall because it's actually quite close to the, the board, maybe like a inch and a half or so. Uh, so just put it back in there with a cable tie as it was originally. Uh, new thermal pads and paste underneath the uh, voltage regulator transistors and stuff. Um, I also had a few of these. Um, I got. Uh, over the time I've, I've picked up two extras as parts and uh, you know, various states of disassembly and disrepair. That's where I got the uh, the uh, option O2 board, the, uh, the HP one. But I also got a few other bits like the uh, this heat spreader. I was just catching bits here and there that um, I saw that wasn't in my unit and just st sticking it in. So this has been like fully optioned out, upgraded and got all the, uh, the bits from multiple units stuck in it. So I uh, got a big aluminium heat spreader here for those uh, transistors, which I guess is going to help. Uh, we've got the, uh, what's this one? This is the control board. It's got the uh, CPU. I'll uh, move that up a bit. The CPU just here. And um, a few ROMs just at the bottom of the screen there. I can't really push that any further up. Uh, a few uh, new capacitors here and there. And um, that's all working good. Over here we've got the uh, new fan installed. So that's all working quite well. It's not too noisy. Um, this one here is the uh, FFS and D to A board. So this is the uh, fractional kind of frequency, the analog frequency uh, conversion, like making the different frequencies from the uh, internal frequency reference, which I believe is 30 megahertz or 10 megahertz if you're using external input or the um, option 001, which is a high stability uh, uh, internal reference so that's doing all the uh, frequency conversion then we got the uh, D to A converter which is digital to analog conversion so um, that's been controlled through the uh, ribbon cables from the uh, CPU so if you flip that over and have a look at the other side we have got the uh, main uh, function board here so that does all the uh, different you know square wave sine wave ramp up and ramp down sawtooth waves um, comes out the bottom here we've got some uh, looks like some drive transistors and whatnot with heat sinks this here is our attenuation board so that uh, selects the different attenuation levels um, and then that go also goes through our uh, option O2 down the bottom corner here so that's sitting there nice and pretty even got the little uh, noise shield there to prevent interference between the boards and over this side we have got our uh, signal source so this is the standard signal source. I've uh, stuck a bit of foam over the uh, the crystal in there because the uh, fan, which is 
sitting just back here blows air straight onto the uh, crystal which can cause a bit of instability um, so I'll put a bit a block of foam there carved it out underneath and uh, stuck it down with a little bit of elastic just to keep that insulated so that the uh, the airflow from here doesn't cause that to drift too much because it's going to be um, subject to whatever the ambient temperature is but with the foam there it's insulated so it's a little bit more stable uh, also uh, oh yeah that's right this this big blank area that's where the um, the ovenized option 001 the ovenized uh, 10 megahertz reference goes that sits there then it plugs into one of the external uh, plugs on the back and then on the back here you just put like a jumper wire from one of the oh there it is the uh, the black plug there a little a jack goes in there and that goes across to the external input so then you switch this to external input but it's actually internal coming out and then back in again I guess that's so you can split this off to other units if you wanted to and um, yeah use it like that so you can use this uh, internal reference for other things but it's probably just as easy for the uh, the people who are making it the HP they just you know give a bit of flexibility and whatnot but I haven't got that because that's a little bit of an expensive option and um, I'll probably end up if I need the extra accuracy I'll probably end up using a GPS reference or something anyway rubidium or something so uh, that is basically all we got inside oh one other note um, I found I don't know if you have one of these and you open up I don't know if you'll find the same thing but I found on two different units uh, the red and uh, purple wires here running down the side come all the way down for the power for this option 002 board uh, they were cut off at the uh, transformer right at the transformer which if if, it, uh, if I catch any of you doing that I'll give you a good old spanking because that's a pain in the ass the um they cut it right off so I could barely even join it on I managed to uh, you know use uh, join on with like the the three millimeters or five millimeters of wire just sitting there and uh, extend it out I don't know why that it was cut off I found it in two units now that that was cut so I don't know if HP did it as a bit of spite because you didn't pay for the options so you'll never get the option snip or what is going on so yeah the the actual wire colors is there's three wires so the two outer are, are red and the center one is um is violet or purple but yeah, I had to do that. Uh, I had to, you know, solder and heat shrink new wires on. So I'll, if you find that, I'll um, I'll add the uh, part number for the uh, the power connector. It's just a Molex connector into the bomb uh, for the option zero two. So you can uh, extend that yourself if need be with the correct connectors and all that. So it's all uh, working as it should. Um, yeah. Apart from that, I think we're pretty much uh, ready to put the lid on and uh, turn this on and see if it works all right we got the thing together everything's installed it's all hooked up ready to give it a smoke test so I've got this hooked up to the scope off screen I'll put um, some screenshots up so you can see what's going on as we work our way through uh, for the uh, non option to test the non high voltage test I've got a, uh, a 50 ohm terminator here um, I'll take that out when we do the high voltage test because that's only good for 40 milliamp output so that's gonna you know make it do some weird stuff but um yeah so we need the 50 ohm terminator when we're doing the normal test without the option so I'll read the peak-to-peak -peak values properly so let's turn it on see what happens fan is fanning screen is screening no smoke no sparks fantastic that's a good sign so let's give it a test uh, in the normal mode without the high voltage uh, option operating to start with so we can see what's going on make sure everything's working first so we at a thousand Hertz one kilohertz with a sine wave uh, the amplitude, so one millivolt now, let's turn up to uh, five volts. And we're getting five volts, peak to peak, perfect. Uh, we'll give it uh, 10 volts. 10 volts peak to peak, that's looking good. All right, let's uh, pull that out. And let's turn on that option. It's going to go to 40 volts because it's like a four times amplification. And we're getting 40 volts peak to peak. Awesome. Uh, 20 volts, oops, 20 volts, not millivolts, 20 volts peak to peak, perfect. How about si uh, square wave? 20 volts peak to peak on the square wave, how about 40, can it do 40? Oh yeah, so what about frequency, let's go to 1 megahertz. That's looking good to me, 1 megahertz, square wave, a bit of a rounding off there, sort of to be expected. The sine wave looks perfect, of course. How about the, uh, oh, we can't do that one at one megahertz. But the triangle wave is looking good too. So that, that's looking pretty good. 40 volt peak to peak. What have you got it set to? Yeah. 
basically 40 volt peak to peak that is happy days I'm happy fantastic it works awesome successfully upgraded my unit so all the files Gerbers and uh, bill of materials and stuff will be down the links below if you want to make your own uh, option to upgrade if you do let us know how you go and uh, I hope you found that informative and interesting we'll see you in the next one